spare time, he runs a uh, meetup for secular progressives. Uh, they meet in a, an IHOP in Monroe in the secret room in the back. Uh, they'll give you the password if you ask. Uh, and since uh, his run for Congress, uh, he's been, what it says here, kind of questioning what the Democratic Party is doing for the secular people and uh, trying to figure out what uh, where to go from there. So without further ado, Bernie Whiteside. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really great to be here and see so many people. Lots of familiar faces, lots of new faces. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I, I, I have to tell you one thing. When I ran for office and I asked for the uh, endorsement of the Secular Coalition, which is <coughs> Hack, I can't remember the name of it. Um, they, the one thing that really stood out for them was that I checked the box atheist. Most of the people who asked, their, asked that for that couldn't quite bring themselves to go all the way over to atheist. They, they, they stopped somewhere around agnostic or a little louder. I can do loud. I really can. <laughs> yeah, I'll elevate for you, okay? Now, uh, but but they had a really hard time getting people to say the word atheist. It, it's uh, it's like scary business for them. I always say this though: atheist describes what I am not. Theist, I am not. But uh, secular humanist describes what I am. I, I'm a person that believes humans need to take care of their issues because God ain't doing it for us, right? So, so we got to take care of these things ourselves. We can't just pray for them and hope they'll rain down out of the sky on us. <laughs> now, since the election, even before the election, I, I've been trying to find labels for myself, and I, and I, I think that's um, it's a hard thing to do, and it's kind of like trying to buy clothes. I, I go out to buy clothes, and I, I'm about six foot tall, and um, I have. A short legs, about a 29 inch inseam, and I don't know if there's any men in here who have tried to find man-sized pants with 29 inch inseams, but they're like non-existent, at least for fat people. I mean, if you're really skinny, you're okay. For us fat guys, we, we ain't getting no 29 inch inseam, so I always have to wear where I'm a little long. And uh, I'm not really asymmetrical, I'm a little bit twisted in the face, and I got one foot that's a little bigger than the other, so what size of shoe do you wear? Well, I don't know. You're going to have one tight shoe and one loose shoe, and you're not. You're going to have to be happy with that, right? And, and so, when I run for uh, office or got involved in politics, I thought, you know, I'm pretty nonpartisan. Uh, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, even taxpayer. I don't care. I'll have two rules. Two rules for what party I'll be a part of. First, they have to actually be able to elect someone with a uh, to a partisan office. If they never elect anyone better than a dog catcher, I, I can't really go that way because you can't affect policy, right? So that rules out some of the parties. And uh, second, uh, you can't be a Republican. <laughs> well, that narrowed it down for me, okay, a little bit. May not have been a perfect fit, but at least it wasn't uncomfortable. How's that? You go out to get on a on a on into a party, you gotta get a jersey, right? You gotta go, go get a blue jersey or a red jersey or one of them other colors of jerseys, right? And when I was younger, um, I used to uh, wear the dark blue jersey, um, and I started looking for dark blue jerseys to, you know, uh, I don't know, you guys know the libertarians are kind of dark blue, right? And the, and the Dems are kind of a light blue. But you didn't see many of them in the store. You know, the store was full of these light blue jerseys using these red ones, so I was kind of stuck with one of those two, and uh, once again, you, you settle for the best you can get. Uh, light blue, dark blue, I'll take what I can get. We, we really are sports team oriented, right? Uh, uh, Homo sapiens have been around for about 800,000 years. And during that period of time, uh, we progressed because we worked together as groups. So we've been teaming up for a very long time. and. Uh, Sometimes uh, we like to do things as individuals. Sometimes we want to do them as couples, small groups, big groups. But in the end, it seems like the bigger the group, the more successful you are. And, and, I, and I'm going to come back to this in a little while because it really defines the difference between the right and the left. 
what's your mindset when it comes to how big your group is? And, uh, and you'll find that on the right, your kin group, the, close, the people that are closest to you, and that starts right with me, is, is where you're at. But on the left, we just have a much bigger group of people we're willing to work with. They just have to get someone elected to office, that's all. Um, so when it comes to politics, uh, cooperation and competition seem to be the thing. If you're, if you're an individual-oriented person, you want to compete. If you're group-oriented, you need to cooperate, okay? And if you cooperate and compete, well, you're somewhere in between, right? A sweet zone, if you would. Let's see here, when I uh, first started, uh, I was you know, looking at politics really close. I was young. I'm gonna guess, uh, you know, uh, I was a teenager and I ran for class president. Um, I ran a nonpartisan election then. And uh, then I went to the military and the Hatch Act kind of limits what you can do in, when it comes to politics. But I read a lot of books. So when I got out of the military, uh, I was kind of ready to jump in with the libertarians. I, I was surprised many years later to discover uh, in my own, my own military records that someone had written of me that uh, I had a natural resentment for authority. And, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know where that came from because I, I always just wanted to be the guy in charge, but I never really cared for the people in charge of me, right? When I, when I got out of the military, I found my way eventually to Denton, Texas. And uh, there, I, there was a population base big enough to find three more people who were libertarians. And we formed the Libertarian Party, and I was uh, the secretary for a while, and then I was the county chair, served on the state executive committee. Um, to make it short, um, it, was a, it was a growing experience for me, trying to understand how parties worked, how conventions worked, how the laws work. And um, that, that really is the story. Political involvement can be very limiting for people if they're not familiar with how the process works. And it takes a long time to absorb all of this data. Now, I, I remember I wanted to find some more libertarians at the time. And so I ran uh, an ad in the personals in the back that I wanted to meet other libertarians. And I started getting phone calls. And I thought, this is hopeful, right? People are calling me. They wanted the job. <laughs> and it took me a little while to figure out what the job was. And they, they, some of the people read this and thought it was like librarians, you see that? Like people kept calling me and assuring me they were perfectly well qualified to be a libertarian. Oh, well, there you go. Has anyone ever heard of the political compass test? Yeah. Anyone yeah. here? One, two, three, few yeah. people here have taken the political compass test? Um, I, I only really bumped into this fairly recently. A, uh, a, uh, a evolutionary biologist who's gotten himself tangled into some politics uh, highly recommended it because um, it, it played on our nature to be individuals, groups, etc., and how we feel about authority and how and uh, whether we we like a lot of it or we'd like a lot of freedom, and it kind of ranks where people are. This test has been in use since uh, 2001, and so there's a, a lot of uh, data out there on this test, if you would. And it was written uh, after consulting some psychology works. It, so it's really a kind of a psychoanalysis, if you would, or a very short psychoanalysis. I highly recommend it to everyone. But what we're really going to talk about today is the compass itself. Now, if you want to take the test, just type in political compass on the internet, uh, politicalcompass.org. Um, and there is at least one place out there where um, someone has done some really good analysis on the political compass that's well worth going to and looking at what they have to say as well. But uh, we're just going to talk about our compasses themselves today. Uh, one of the most difficult problems I have faced in politics is discovering what team I should be on. That's really a problem because I want to label myself accurately. I don't want to misrepresent myself to the world nor do I wish to team up with people that I find disagreeable, right? I reserve the right to be disagreeable myself, and at least two people in this room get it. <laughs> well, three. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm not going to tell you what party you should be along to. You should all be nonpartisan, just like me, but uh, just like me. <laughs> but uh, I kind of abandoned uh, my libertarian politics 
and joined the Democratic Party back in 2011, uh, primarily because I wanted to actually make a difference and not just talk about making a difference. And I found uh, the tent was a little bigger there. I'm going to tell you a Republican story uh, because I contacted the Republican Liberty Caucus to see, was there a place here for me? And the fellow on the phone asked me one question. Can you bring $5,000 to my office today? <laughs> and I said, I don't think so. I can give you lots of hours of time. I can work on my street and my network, make phone calls, uh, find friends, write things on the internet. Well, what we really need to make a difference is $5,000. I said, well, I'm glad you told me that. I'll call the other guys. And, and, and that really is the case. And it, it, to play in politics, uh, you almost have to bring a lot of money to the table. When I'm through with this, this piece, I'll talk just a little about my own experience running for office. And I'm going to suggest to you that you don't need to spend as much money as they think to have an effective campaign. Doesn't mean you're going to win. You're going to win for different reasons. But, but money seemed to be the thing that was going to make it work for them. Okay. 1789, going back to history, King Louis XVI brought together a great assembly of people called the Estates General. Okay, and the Estates General was, it was three estates. The first estate was the clergy, because God had picked them out in his own self, and they sat on the right of the king. The second estate was the nobles. Hey, God picked them out too, pretty much, by birth, and so they sat on the left, and in the back, were the communes, the commoners. Um, the, the funny thing is the commoners were not that common, okay? Just in case you thought some of them worked at Walmart or McDonald's, they didn't. The, the communes were small business owners. They were, they were shop owners, merchants, skilled craftsmen, and some of the more professional class. They were the middle class of their day. And it's these communes that weren't very happy because God had told them that they had arisen to the level of their maximum levelness. And they kind of wanted to break down a door and rise a little higher. And this made them, what, what do we call them? Uh, um, resolutionaries of sorts, right? And uh, they wanted to put a seat at the table. And as this uh, assembly continued over a period of several years, the revolutionary commoners tended to sit on the left and on the right were the nobles and the clergy who believed that the king was the one God wanted to do it. And I think we all know how that worked out for the king, right? <laughs> Revolutionaries um, have a way of getting their way. If they, if they can't get it through a good dialogue and a political process, they usually resort to something like violence. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much in favor of dialogue and uh, voting, okay? I think we can still do that for a few more years. <laughs> Power to the people. Yeah, something like that. So now, keep in mind though that these um, these people weren't all people. Again, they were a small group, the middle class. The vast majority of people were not well represented by the commoners. Okay, but if you were one of the poor and you thought your lot in life could be improved, what was your best shot? The clergy and the nobles or the commoners? Hey, you know what, if you, if you stack people up at the bottom, and I'm going to use that phrase a couple of times long enough, that the way they will fix this problem is they will break the whole system. And when it's all broken, they'll all hope they found a place in it. And, th and that's kind of what they did. So these seating arrangements are the origins of our original left and right ideologies. Uh, the, the, left call, uh, the left called the members of the right conservatives conservatives, okay? And then it's from the Latin compound of a word that has con in it. And the con is the same con you will find in control. And the other part is serve, which is the same word you'll find in servant. So they were complimenting them by calling them conservatives. Yeah, they were, they were a class of people politi who politically believed they were the natural, God-chosen controllers of all of the rest of you who are 
naturally better suited to be servants. <laughs> now, uh, now, I would argue that that's true to this day. I, I know that almost no one who calls themselves a conservative would ever say that out loud, but think about what conservatives stand for, and when we look at our actual compass, you'll see where they fit on the, gra on the graph and how close they fit to fundamentalism and traditionalism and status quo and the, the, rich, the rich run the show and the poor just do what they're told, okay? The, the right, called the left, liberals, or li, li, liberal, it's French, but the, the uh, English mocks the, uh, the poor people in England, calling them liberals with a rich, thick, in, uh, Latin. let's see, I just said your dog, I got to work on my thing, you know. Um, and, uh, <laughs> is that, uh, no, it's not my dog, you know. Anyone know that joke? <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 it's Peter Sellers. Is that, uh, does your dog bite? <laughs> no, my dog does not bite. <laughs> it gets bit. <laughs> I thought you said the dog does not bite. That's not my dog. <laughs> a little, little French humor for you, right? <laughs> so, so, so the left were actually um, re, you know, in a state of rebellion. And this is, and they were the liberals. And I'm going to make an argument that the liberal class is the natural class of revolutionaries. And we may not have any liberals in our society, or if we do, they're, they're probably not quite ready for a revolution, even if they say the word. But uh, the, the, the other uh, way we can look at the left is we can think of them as the Democrats and the Republicans, but uh, I'm not so sure the Democrats are that far to the left. They were once, weren't they? And of course, remember, though, back in the days of FDR, um, FDR got elected with the support of socialists and communists and even had a socialist for a vice president. So we had a very much more left-leaning world in the 1929, 1930, after the Great Depression because people were tired of being at the bottom and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt told the, the, the very wealthy capitalists, you, you can keep your stuff unless they come and kill you and take it. Maybe you should give me some tax money and I could hire a few of them and they would be happier and less inclined to kill you and take your things. And they thought that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, so he, uh, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt bragged many years later that he, he didn't, it wasn't the poor he saved, it was the capitalists he saved because they would have take the, the, they would have killed them all. Yeah, but he did a lot for a country. He did, absolutely. <laughs> so we can see today that the, um, that the, 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 the so-called left, the Democrats, are what um, came out of this, these communes, and they were, the, they were the bourgeoisie of their day, and, uh, and uh, they were not uh, the lumpetariat, as they called them, the, the, the working poor. And, uh, and the, the, uh, pro, so the Poles were not really well represented then, and aren't today. Was that a Willy Wonka reference? You know, I wonder sometimes if Willy Wonka called them Oompa Loompas because of that. That, that Karl Marx, um, in his work, talked about the Loompatariat, and they were they were the they were the folks who um, worked in the factories. The proles were were poor, but they weren't that poor. The Loompatariat were way down there. It, it, many people don't realize this, but in France, there were literally naked people in the streets. Imagine the po a level of poverty that you would have to find to literally find naked people in the streets. That's pretty rough. Yeah. You wonder when we will revolt. Look for naked people. Not fat ones either. <laughs> that's just a, that's just one of those beaches, you know. <laughs> the first lady doesn't. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> So when we start looking at the uh, conservatives and uh, the, the liberals, we see that the liberals want to break down doors and get themselves in. But the funny thing happens when you broke down the door and you get in. You close it behind you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't have to say that out loud, okay? You close the door behind you. If you don't close it, it closes anyway because the nature of being on the inside is to try and stay on the inside. And the neoliberal movement is the revolutionaries of the past who got in, and they kind of forgot the people they left behind. And I don't know what percentage of society has been left behind, but my estimate is something close to 60%, maybe a little more, not less. And, um, and so what we have is we have one class of owners that own lots, 
and think that they that they uh, should control it all. And another class of people who have made their way in by getting a good education or getting skills, and now they feel like they're fit to be the owners and controllers. But this other class of people, the 60% or so, <coughs> eh, not so much. You know, we know that half of America can't scrape together $500 for a car repair. That tells you where you're at. So what, what makes um, people who are desperately poor want to be allied with um, the Republicans or the Democrats, considering the fact that the, the Democrats and the Republicans are both a natural class of owners just competing to see who can own? Well, we all want to improve our lot in life. And uh, we ask ourselves, who, who should we attach ourselves to? Not so much like the uh, Lupitariat, who um, when the bourgeois um, commoners got a place at the table, they thought, well, who will help us out and give us a place at the table more? And so we see the same thing today. And if you think that, uh, that, that you got a great business leader at the top who is going to create lots of industry, you see yourself getting some of the trickle down, if you would, some of the jobs and things, and that might be your path forward. Or you might see that your path forward is through education and programs. Then you might want to go to the left, right? And, but, but either way, you're kind of um, gambling that the, other, the people on the other side of the door care about you. Most people just want a job. Yeah, that's just true. Um, we, we, all, we all value ourselves for what we do for a living. And we rank ourselves socially, politically, and economically by our job titles and our, and our amount of income that we earn. And, uh, maybe if we aren't doing it, if we were retired, we'd, what our job title used to be and what our retirement check looks like. Either any way you look at it, um, people just want to make sure that they are secure. But we're very secure, insecure as a people, especially the more of us there are. And I saw a book back there, where, what, what is the maximum population the Earth can sustain? Um, you know, if we, if, as we reach that point, some are going to fall out. And you don't want to be in the falling out category, right? So. Um, the popular myth of the Republican Party is this, that they are the job creators, they will create you jobs, and then the popular myth of the Democratic Party is that if you get an education or a job skill, a job will just pop out of nowhere for you. That's how it works, right? You go to school and boom, there's a job. I don't think so. There's another popular myth that the Democratic Party is the party of the left. I, I've mentioned that a few times. It, it really isn't. It's, it's a right-leaning a right party. The truth is that the so-called job creators really just profit. <laughs> they're, they're profit creators, not job creators, profit creators. Yes. And they'll, they'll destroy as many jobs they need to to create a profit. And getting an education doesn't create jobs. Uh, it just creates a, a, a mountain of debt uh, that has needs to be serviced, so it creates profits for the lenders. OK, I'm losing my focus here. And I, I even wrote that at the bottom. I knew I would lose my focus when I started talking about economics. So I'm going to change my focus. I know I'm going to get really focused on something that everyone will identify with, chimp status. Chimp status? Yeah, because we're all kind of chimps, don't you think? Uh, they, they, <laughs> you know, we share more genetic uh, material in common with the bonobo chimps than the African elephant shares in common with the Indian elephant. And so we can kind of look at chimp behavior and say something about human behavior there, unless Jesus is uh, made us from scratch or whatever he did and made us look like chimps or not, whatever he made us look like, right? So all the chimps are creating for so are, are, are competing. See, this is the early chimp society. We're all competing for social, political, and economic status because we're kind of a little bit insecure in our group. And we know if we're higher up in the group, we're more likely to get food, sex, whatever it is that we, we feel uh, be safe from uh, predation, safe from our fellows. And uh, some are going alone because they feel strong and they feel like, uh, I, I got the muscle, I don't need any of you, and others are working together. And, and I think this is where we see the early origins of, uh, of competition versus cooperation. Uh, the women were the first to get it right. Women were the great cooperators in the great evolutionary scheme. They worked together to plant gardens and catch small animals, but men only really come together for one thing, and that's to, to kill something really big or get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> the hypothetical far right social structure looks something like this. On the far right, you have a ladder, and everyone's competing to climb the ladder. At the top of the ladder, there's the chimp number one, and underneath is chimp number two, and number three, and four, and so on. And somewhere way down there, because it's a long ways from the top to the bottom of this ladder, there's a great big pile of, of chimps that are stacked up at the bottom. 
And, and, the, and the natural tendency when you have a ladder with just like one rung on it all the way up is to stack people up at the bottom. Only so many folks are going to fit on that ladder, right? So, and then each person who's on the ladder feels really good about this. They're a little worried about the chimp behind them because about the only way to move up the ladder is to bump the chimp off of this above you, right? Yeah. And it's a long way to the bottom. The, uh, the, the, the left, and this is, this is just a hypothetical extreme because neither the right nor the left ever has actually existed. But on the left, it's something like a level playing field. Everyone's at the top. Or everyone's at the bottom. I don't know. Everyone's at the same level, and we all feel good about that because no one's better than anyone else, right? Well, that ain't never been true either. Because, it, it, because in society, um, we look for people to be more competent or useful. We, we want to promote them a little bit. The, the person who knows where the berry is, that's the person we follow out in the woods to find the berries. Not the person who says, I'm hungry for berries, but have no idea where they are, okay? <laughs> so so we, we look for people to rise um, based on their competence and usefulness in various areas, but how, how, how rigid a system do we want? We're gonna have to work together, so maybe we need to move a little bit left and cooperate a bit. And we can't have this great gap between the top and the bottom with a few vicious competitors at the top and everyone else stacking up at the bottom. We know what happens. Eventually, someone pulls the bottom off front of the ladder and knocks all the monkeys down. Okay. Continuing on with the chimp status, okay? Of course, neither the far right or the far left structures exist. They're only hypothetical. Everyone's really somewhere in between. Some people will always be better qualified for technical work and leadership than others. And we all benefit when someone has a higher skill level and we follow them. So, so somewhere in between is happy ground. Um, I have another analogy here, and it's the playground. Every playground has a bully on it. And, and so this is kind of the demonstration that there's no such thing really as the far right and the far left. One of the things I know about bullies on playgrounds is they never go it alone. The bully always has a couple friends with them. They really do, and this is true in gym society too. 